success. And as I thought about what success means, more and more, I sort of reflected on my own journey here in Singapore. My own decade of spending and working here in Singapore. And as I thought about success, and thought about success at work, more and more, I thought about it in the context of writing a letter to my younger self. What would I have told my younger self 10, 15 years ago about success? What are things I wish I knew 10 or 15 years ago that would have prevented me from chasing after things that don't really matter? What would I have wished I knew 10 or 15 years ago to convince me to invest my time and effort and energy in things that have eternal consequences. That would have saved me a lot of pain, heartache, prevented me from sinning a lot. But you know, God is gracious, and God is always faithful. One of the things I wish I knew 10, 15 years ago was Pastor Bong's message last week about true success. True success. And remember, one of the quotes that stuck with me was this. Our greatest fear should not be failure, but what? Succeeding in something that doesn't really matter. That should be our greatest fear. Because what is true success? Becoming all that God wants you to be, and doing all that God wants you to do, and hearing Him say, into the joy of your master. There's one thing I want to pick on quickly here. Notice that becoming should precede doing. Being should precede doing. You are not defined by what you do. You are defined by who you are. And we are all made in the image of God to do His will for His flesh. Because one day, we're all going to stand in front of him, give an account of our lives, and hopefully, we'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That is true success. So today, as we continue on with our series on life goals, we're going to ask the question, how do we succeed at work? Obviously defining what success is, and what work is in the process. So going back to my journey, thinking about my decade in Singapore, writing to my younger self, what are things I wish I told myself 10 years ago? So 10 years ago, I was a 27-year-old, moved to Singapore. I just finished my MBA. I just signed on to be a management consultant. So a management consultant is somebody that borrows your watch to tell you the time. That's what I do. Borrowing your watch, tell you the time. I signed my first six-figure contract. My student loans, all paid for by my signing bonus. So I thought I was on my way to success, to conquering the world. I was ready. Or so I thought. Or so I thought. Because this is how I felt like on a daily basis when I was working. How many of you feel this way when you work? No, okay, that's fine. Yes, on the outside, everything might seem peachy, nice, good. Different channels. This is how I felt. There was a recent survey. Job Street. Fifty percent of people working in Singapore today are unhappy at work, for one reason or the other. Do, be, do you guys belong on the happy side, or the unhappy side, or it shifts depending on the day, time, week? And there are various reasons to that. We're not paid enough, no matter how high our salary is. Inflation for our friends in the Philippines is now 6%. We're not paid enough. Job security, and this is something I've felt as well, might not have a job tomorrow. Worry. We're worried about tomorrow. I'm not appreciated, no matter how high hard I try every day 
Nobody notices what I do. I'm not appreciated. How many of you guys feel this way? Too much work. Too much. Too much. When I started out my career in consulting, I used to work 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week when I was on an engagement. And I sort of held that up as a badge of honor. It's just as if the more hours I worked, the better I was. And obviously, it's not sustainable. I burned out. I burned out completely. I burned out completely. Too much work. I'm smarter than my boss. How many of you guys feel this way? <laughs> Even if we are, we still need to make him or her look good. Stuck in this position forever, not getting promoted. Or on the flip side, I actually have friends who don't want to get promoted. So they're actually mad when they do because they don't want to manage people. You can never make people happy sometimes. My boss is from the dark side who has horrible bosses here. I know it's quite funny, but these are also legitimate concerns, things that we feel. And yet, and I felt a lot of this, and yet I continued on, pushing, 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 because Singapore is a land of success and opportunity. And for some of us, we want to be crazy rich Asians. Who wants to be a crazy rich Asian? I heard the movie's great. So if you want to be a crazy rich Asian, you need to come back next week when we're going to be talking about finances. So you'll have to ask Pastor Richard how to be a crazy rich Asian. And if I were to tell my younger self something, it would be this. The trouble with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Similar to D.L. Moody's quote earlier. We chase after the wrong things. No matter how successful we become, it really won't matter at the end. And I start and submit to you, it's because we have a wrong view of work. So I ask you today, why do we work? Why do we work? Do we work because that's what defines us? Do we work and say, well, it's secular, but it's not sacred? Do we work because it's a necessary evil, something we just need to do on a daily basis? Do we work because it's a means to an end? I think a lot of us feel that way with work. Work to earn money, to pay the bills, to send the kids to school, to retire well. What if we die tomorrow and don't reach retirement? Can we categorize our life and our work as a success? Something to think about, something to ponder. Some people say work is a curse. Partially true. But I'm here today to tell you that work is so much more. Work is so much more. To do that, I'm going to play a video. This is a commercial that came out by Nike a few days ago. Quite controversial, but I just wanted to pull out a few big themes as we talk about it in the context of work. If people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you think you can do, good. Stay that way. Because what non-believers fail to understand is that calling a dream crazy is not an insult. It's a compliment. Don't try to be the fastest runner in your school or the fastest in the world. Be the fastest ever. Don't picture yourself wearing OBJ's jersey. Picture OBJ wearing yours. Don't settle for homecoming queen or linebacker. Do both. Lose 120 pounds and become an Ironman. 
after beating a brain tumor. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. If you're born a refugee, don't let it stop you from playing soccer for the national team at age 16. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. When they talk about the greatest team in the history of the sport, make sure it's your team. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football. Play it at the highest level. And if you're a girl from Compton, don't just become a tennis player. Become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. Don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they are crazy enough. And I submit to you today that whatever crazy dreams you have, God's dream for you, your life, your work, is so much better. That's what I want to talk to you about today. We have a wrong view of work. It defines who I am, it's secular, not sacred, it's a means to an end, it's a necessary evil, it's a curse. If we overlay that with some big themes that I picked up from this commercial, it would look something like this. Instead of defining who you are, be somebody. Secular, not sacred, don't settle. Means to an end, well, then believe in something, even if it's worth sacrificing everything. Necessary evil, well, then be bigger. And finally, it's a curse, then dream crazy. Dream crazy. And whatever crazy dreams we have, God's dream is much better. Because true success at work begins with the right view of work. True success at work begins with the right view at work. Because your work matters to whom? It matters to God. Your work matters to God. And God matters to your work. Your work matters to God and God matters to your work. So I want to talk to you guys about five things today. Instead of just being somebody, what we need to figure out is how to move from success to significance. Instead of just settling or not settling, what we need to do is embrace dignity in the everyday. Instead of just believing in something, we need to believe in the right thing and personify grit and risk in the process. And I'll explain to you what grit is in a bit more detail. When we say be bigger, what I really want us to do is do great by doing right. And when we dream crazy, it's really about putting all our hope in a redeemer. Five things. I want to talk to you today. But before that, can I just ask everyone to bow your heads and let's start in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here today. Singapore is a wonderful place, a place of our dreams, a place of an opportunity, a place hopefully for success, success that matters for all of us. Help us, Father, today to understand what success looks like in your books. Help us to understand how to truly succeed at work and hopefully we come out here changed. I lift up to you all the hearts that are here, including my own, Lord. May this time be all about you. And any preparations, Father, that I have, please override and just speak the words that you want me to speak to your people today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So moving from success to significance. Zuckerberg says, finding your purpose is not enough. 
The challenge for our generation is creating a world where everyone has a sense of purpose. I partially agree with him. I agree with the first statement. Finding purpose is not enough. Finding legitimate purpose is. It has to be legitimate. And I also partially agree with the second point. There already is a world with a sense of purpose, a world that was created by God, a world that is created by God. The challenge for all of us today is who created purpose and to find him who created purpose for us. Because it exists and we can't create it, only God can. True success at work. Do not let work define who you are. Instead, let's discover legitimate purpose in the author of work himself. Discover legitimate purpose in the author of work himself. If you think about work, one of the synonyms to work is vocation. And they say work is a vocation. So if we replace work with vocation, and track its original meaning. In Latin, the verb is voca, which means to call. That means work is a calling. We all were called to work. Work is a calling for all of us. Work is a calling. And if you look at the ultimate example to working, imagine God worked from day one. God worked from day one. I'm going to walk closer so I can see. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God worked from day one. God was a worker. And God calls us to work. Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden. To what? To cultivate it and keep it. He called us to work. He worked, created us, and then called us to work. Work is a calling. And God doesn't stop. In creation, he worked for six days, rested on the seventh. His day. But also because by the sixth day, everything was finished. And he called everything good. But God keeps working. Every day, every second of our lives, he keeps working in each and every one of us. God keeps working. This is Jesus speaking, John 5, 17. He answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. He never quits. He never gives up on you. He continues to work in you. And you know what? It's just not a calling. It's a blessing. God blessed us with work. God blessed us with work, and he cares about our work. He's not just a mindless slave master. He cares about our work deeply. God created man in his own image. We saw this last week. In the image of God, he created him male and female. And what? He blessed them, including our work. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And then what did he say? And fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Work is part of the creation story. Work is what we were called to do. And God blessed it. And God wants us to find joy in our work. Another story. This is Eric Little. And hopefully this example punches it home. Does anybody know who Eric Little is? Yeah. I see some heads nodding. It's an amazing man, an amazing Christian. So Eric Little, he was born in China, northern China, 
uh, Tianjin, I might be pronouncing it wrong, 1902. He was born to missionary parents. And then he got sent back to Scotland for boarding school, and that's where he grew up. And that's where he became a sports superstar. He was good at cricket. He was great at rugby. He could have represented the country in international competitions. But his passion, his real passion was to run. His real passion was to run. And he was a great world-class runner. He was going to represent Great Britain in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris. And not just represent, he was the Usain Bolt of his time. So what is one of the marquee events in the Olympics? The 100-meter dash. The 100-meter dash. And it makes people like Usain Bolt famous. So Eric Little was the Usain Bolt of that time, favored to win the 100-meter dash. He was favored to win. There was only one problem, at least for Eric Little, who was a professing Christian. The 100-meter dash, the heats, they needed to be run on a Sunday. You're so close to a gold medal. You were the favorite to win a gold medal. But he had a different perspective of work, a different perspective of his calling. And it wasn't about winning a gold medal. It was about honoring his calling. And that calling was to honor God. So did he run the 100-meter dash? No, he refused. Because no gold medal could compare to the joy he found in his maker. Instead, Eric Little was also entered into other competitions during the games, one of which was the 400-meter dash. He wasn't the favorite in the 400 meters. He wasn't the favorite. Some people thought he had a chance, but nobody thought he would win. So some of us know the story. Gold medal, 400-meter dash, world-breaking time. And although the 100-meter dash was the marquee event of those games, this was one of the most talked about events because of his story, because of his public profession of his faith. It made for a wonderful story. Arthur Marshall, in one of the biographies, says, it was thought that Little had some chance of winning 400 meters, but nobody thought Little capable of the amazing performance he achieved in the finals. He came out of nowhere to win because he honored God. It's also said in his biography that somebody passed a note to him just before the race. And this was what it said in the note. 1 Samuel 2.30. Those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. Little understood his place. Little understood why he worked. Little understood his calling to honor his maker, his boss, his true master. After the games, he went back to China. This is an actual statue of him in China, in northern China. Continued to share Jesus. So whether he was in school, whether he was running, whether he was back in China, for him, it was all about his calling to honor God in everything he did. Eric Little said, God made me fast. And when I run, what? I feel his pleasure. When you work every day, do you feel God's pleasure. If work is a calling, are you honoring God? And do you feel his pleasure? 
you want to check out more, they made a movie, Chariots of Fire, 1982. Again, great movie about the Christian faith. And it won four Academy Awards, including the best picture at the Oscars. So it's a great movie to check out. Work, brothers and sisters, is a calling. It does not define who you are. We were called to work. Work is something you were called to do. To, call, to do what? To honor God. We were called to honor God in what we do. So again, do you feel God's pleasure when you work? Do you feel his pleasure? And the first point I want to leave with you today is this. When you think about work as a calling, we have to move from success to significance and discover the pleasure of your maker. First point, move from success to significance and discover the pleasure of your maker. Point number one. And then embrace dignity in the everyday. What do I mean by that? Work is not secular, brothers and sisters. Work is sacred. Work is sacred. And how do we express sacredness? We express it by everyday dignity. What do I mean by that? Simple. Express dignity as excellence in your work. Express dignity as excellence in your work. Excellence. So another story. I moved consulting firms in 2011, and one of the consultants that was under me, he was just fantastic. Pound for pound, he was one of the smartest people I ever met. He was one of the greatest communicators I've ever met. His work ethic was just fantastic. And he was killing it. Everybody knew back then that he would go all the way. And his career trajectory has been like this. He'll probably end up a CEO sometime soon, somewhere, or start up his own business, or he's just great. He's very, very successful. And we had coffee, so he's also a good friend. We, we had coffee one day when I was just getting to know him. And we started sharing our faiths. And it's amazing that I discovered he was a Christian. And then it all made sense to me. That's why he was so excellent at his work. Because he had Jesus behind him. And can you imagine his testimony? That people would come to him because he was excellent. People would be drawn to him at work because he was excellent. And when they got closer, all they saw was Jesus. So that's a challenge for everybody here today who professes to be a Christian. Are you excellent in your work? Are you recognized for excellence in your work? Excellent enough that people will come to you. And then they see Jesus. Because that's what we need to aspire for. And it's not only excellence. We also need to understand the big picture. This is a nice shot of Florence, another beautiful city. This is the Domo de Florence Cathedral. So let's imagine, let's walk back in time, all the way back to the Middle Ages. And let's imagine this beautiful cathedral is being built. And imagine there's a nobleman walking, you know, head up high, checking out the work in the cathedral. He bumps into a stonemason and asks him about his work. And the stonemason says, I've chosen the best stones that will form the base of this beautiful cathedral. Fantastic. Next, he talks to a glassmaker. He asks about his work. And the glassmaker says, I'm creating this beautiful stained glass that will serve as nice artwork in the cathedral. Then he bumps into a carpenter, and the carpenter tells him, 
I'm putting all this good wood together, and with, it will help with the structure of the cathedral. And then finally, he bumps into a peasant woman, cleaning the floor, taking out the dirt, taking out the trash, mopping up. And he asks her, what are you doing here? The woman answers, I am building a cathedral for the glory of God. I am building a cathedral for the glory of God. She understood the theology of work. All of us at the end, we're doing something, whatever it is, for the glory of God. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what your title is. All we're doing is for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We work for the glory of God. Colossians 3, 22, 24. Slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth. Not with external service, no. As those merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Ask for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord whom you serve. Work heartily. That's dignity. For who? For an audience of one. For God. Imagine. It's a question to ask yourself today. How would you work if God was your boss? Your direct boss, your manager, your supervisor. How would you work if God was your customer? How would you act? How would you work if God was your finance officer? How would you work if God was your shareholder? Would you change your attitude today? Would you do your work differently? How would you work on a day-to-day -day basis if you ask yourself this question? What would you change? 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 to 11 says, we urge you, brethren, to what? Excel still more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands. We're called to excel. We're called to excel and yet not boast. And do what? Work with your hands. What does that mean? So when this was being written, one of the dominant cultures at the time were the Romans and the Greeks. And for the Greeks, all work, especially the work of your hands, was undignified. They would never work. They were too noble to work. They just wanted to philosophize all day create art, and again, nothing against that. But they looked down on the work, anybody that was working with their hands. And yet, that's what we need to do, is to express dignity in the work of our hands. Whatever that work is, express dignity. I like how William Tyndale puts it. If we look externally, there is difference between washing dishes and preaching the word of God but as touching to please God, there is no difference at all. I love it. That's the biblical view of work, that there's no difference when done to honor of the Lord between preaching and washing the dishes. You know, this is one of the lies of religion, that sometimes if you're up here, you're sometimes more spiritual or sacred. If you're in some sort of ministry within the church, you're suddenly more sacred. If you're going out there to preach the word to tribal people, you're suddenly more sacred. If you're singing up here, if you're leading a D group, you're suddenly more sacred. And again, these are all good things. But we shouldn't forget that whatever we're called to do, in terms of honoring God, it's all equal. That has to be the right view of work. There's no difference between preaching and when we're washing the dishes, 
when it comes to honoring the Lord. No difference. Because all work is sacred. All work is sacred. All our callings are equal. There are no second class callings from God. Andy Mills. There are no second class callings from God. All work is sacred. Martin Luther King. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived the great street sweeper who did his job well. Work with excellence for the honor of your God. Because all work is sacred. And all work is sacred for an audience of one at the end. So work for the best boss. Work for your real master. Be the best. Work with excellence. Embrace dignity in the everyday. And discover the glory of your holy God. So move from success to significance and discover the pleasure of your maker. Embrace dignity in the everyday and discover the glory of your holy God. Third point, and then let's personify grit times risk. Because work is not a means to an end. Work is never just a means to an end. Work actually purposefully creates. Purposefully creates. That's what we were meant to do. God created the earth, but everything in the earth he gave to us to work with our hands. In other words, to purposefully create. And how do we do that? It's with grit and risk. It's with grit and risk. So what do I mean by grit? Angela Duckworth, noted psychologist, writer of the book Grit, famous TEDx speaker, said that the single biggest indicator of success, it's not IQ, it's not talent, it's not EQ, it's grit. And how did she define grit? It's passion multiplied by perseverance for very long-term goals. That is grit. And if you think about passion multiplied by perseverance, multiplied by the willingness to take risk, that's when we start to purposefully create. Passion multiplied by perseverance, multiplied by risk. To do that, I'll illustrate it with a story from the Bible. I know a lot of you know this story as well. It's the parable of the talents. So there was this rich master, and he needed to go on a long journey, which is typical of that day. Might have been for business meetings, it might have been to acquire, partner, buy new companies. And he called his three slaves. He called his three slaves in, managers of the household. To the first slave, he gave five talents. To the second slave, he gave two talents. And to the third slave, he gave one talent. All commensurate with their ability. And today we define talents as gifts, skills that we have. But in the original text, talent simply means a measure of weight, typically of gold and silver. How much was it worth? Think about your annual salary, quickly. Multiply that by 20 years. That's how much one talent was worth, some scholars say. Equal to 20 years worth of wages. Other people say that if you were to have one talent today, it would, have be, it would be worth at least a million dollars. So can you imagine even the slave that had one? That was a big responsibility. So what did they do when the master left? First one went out with grit, with risk, took the five talents, and was able to get five more. The second slave, same thing took the two out, invested, 
gained two more. They knew what needed to be done. They knew what the master entrusted them with. The third slave, however, had a wrong view of the master. And what did he do instead? Dug a hole in the ground and what? Buried the talent. When the master came back after a long time, so he didn't come back at once, he was actually given a good long time or period for these guys to really do something with the talents. First slave comes in, tells the master, you gave me five, I have five more, here are 10 talents. And the master says, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in the little things. I will give you more things to manage. Enter into my joy. Second slave comes in, same thing. He said, you gave me two, I got you two more. And the master says, well done, good and faithful slave. Notice exactly the same. You were faithful in the little things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into my joy. But the third slave, the master said, you wicked and lazy slave. Because he came back giving the same one talent. He said, you could have at least put it in the bank. That was the bare minimum. And it would have earned interest for me. You couldn't even meet the bare minimum of my expectations. Instead, you chose to go your own way, your own way. Let's read the text. Text, excuse me. One second. So the man went on a journey, called his own slaves, and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Each according to their own ability. And he went on his journey. So today, I'm sure a lot of you guys here in the audience are five talent people. Some of us here today could be two or one talent people. It doesn't matter. Because as we said earlier, all work is sacred. All callings are sacred. They're all equal in the eyes of God. The bigger question is, what are you doing with the gifts that you have been given? What are you doing with the skills that you have been given? Because it's stewardship. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Look at what the first two slaves did. It says immediately. They knew what needed to be done. They knew what was expected of them. They knew what was entrusted to them and what they needed to do. It's interesting that the third slave saw this differently. There was a very cautious man who never laughed or played. He never risked, he never tried, he never sang or prayed. And when he one day passed away, his insurance was denied. For since he never really lived, they claimed he never really died. Would it, it would be so sad if any of us here ends up like this. If the last description of our life is something like this. He never, she never really lived. We don't want to be in that same situation. This was the third slave. Faith sometimes is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith sometimes is expressed as risk. So embrace the risk of failure. And it's not blind faith. If there are things really worth fighting for, if there are things that are truly worth believing for, then risk it all. And I submit to you today that Jesus is worth all of our risk. Jesus is worth all of our risk. And the returns 
that Jesus offers is exponentially greater than anything you can ever dream of, no matter how crazy your dreams are. Jordan, I can accept failure. Everyone fails at something. But I can't accept not trying, especially if you were built for something beautiful and wonderful, if you were called for work, and that work is sacred. Remember, a ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. It's not what ships are built for. Now, after a long time, again, he didn't go and come back at once. All the slaves have ample time to steward these talents well. The master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Angela Duckworth, as I said, grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. You need to stick with it. The first two slaves were purposefully creating. They were given talents, worked with their hands, created so much more. That's how we purposefully create with grit and with the willingness to take risk. And we define grit as passion times perseverance times risk. And I argue that these two slaves, although not explicitly mentioned in the text, had passion. They had passion because they understood what their master wanted them to do. They went and did it immediately. And they persevered. Remember, their master was gone for a long time. They could have gone another path, but they stuck with it. And they did what? They took risks for the right reasons. Passion times perseverance times risk equal purposefully creating. The one who had received the five talents came up, brought five talents more, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. What does his master say? Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Notice the first slave and the second slave. The master told them exactly the same thing. It didn't matter that he brought five talents more or two, two talents more. They got exactly the same reward at the end, which is really to enter into the joy of your master. Because for everybody, that is more than enough. That is more than enough. Because work, brothers and sisters, is stewardship. So please, be a good steward of what you have been given. Be faithful to your calling. Purposefully create. Personify grit, which is passion times perseverance. Be willing to take risks and discover the joy of your faithful master. Move from success to significance and discover the pleasure of your maker. Embrace dignity in the everyday and discover the glory of your holy God. Personify grit and risk and discover the joy of your faithful master. Fourth point, do great by doing right. Do great by doing right. Work is necessary, but it is not evil. It is not evil. Work is good. Work is actually great. So do great by doing what is right. How do we do that? We need to define what right is. So we need to follow a moral compass when we work that is based on absolute truth. And I submit to you today, there is only one basis for absolute truth, and that is the Bible. That's it. That is your moral compass at work. Continue on with the story. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, 
You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. How did the master categorize the slave? Lazy was a bit obvious, I guess, but wicked? Why? Because remember in the beginning, when the master entrusted the talents, the slaves knew what was expected of them. And imagine, there was even a bare minimum. He could have just put the talent in the bank to earn interest. He couldn't even do that, or even refuse to do that. The reason being, he had a very wrong view of the master. And because he had a very wrong view of who the master was, he had a very wrong view of work that wasn't aligned to the expectation of what he was supposed to deliver. What happened to him? Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. I like how it's said in James 4, 16 to 17. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew what was entrusted to him. But the problem was, he didn't know who his master was. He didn't know or didn't have a right view of who his master was. And because of that, he didn't have a right view of how to work. What was the result? Everything. Everything was taken away from him. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. Talent may get you to the top, but it takes character to keep you there. John Wooden most successful college basketball coach in history, 10 NCAA championships, coach Kareem, Bill Walton, keeps character to keep you there. Because work is ethical. Work is ethical. So please, be accountable for what you have been given. Be responsible. The buck stops with you. Be obedient to authority. Understand what you're being asked to do, and do it well. Work is ethical. You have to have moral principles at work. And you need to base those on absolute truth. Do great by doing right, and discover the abundance of your righteous God. Move from success to significance, and discover the pleasure of your maker. Embrace dignity in the everyday, and discover the glory of your holy God. Personify grit and risk and discover the joy of your faithful master. Do great by doing right and discover the abundance of your righteous God. And my last point, hope in a redeemer. And with that, I'll try to do my take on the greatest story that's ever been told about the greatest worker in history that was there right before the beginning of time. The greatest worker in history who worked from day one, created the heavens and the earth, the whole universe, everything in existence. He created you and me. He created the first man, and he had a plan for them, a wonderful plan to work with their hands everything that he created, to steward over his creation. But man did not listen. He did not. Instead, he went his own way. He defined success on his own terms. He defined work on his own terms. And because of that, he was separated from the master, from the greatest worker. And no matter how hard this man tried to work and work and work, he could never bridge that gap back to his creator. Never, not on his own. And his master understood that. So the greatest worker in history needed to do the work instead. And 2,000 years ago, he entered into time, entered into history, became a man himself, 
humbled himself, taking the form of a man and being completely obedient to the point of death, even death at the cross. Because the greatest worker in history loved us. He was a carpenter most of his life, giving dignity to the work of his hands and the work of everybody's hands. But he never forgot his purpose. He never forgot his true calling. So at the age of 30, he ministered. He ministered about what he was going to do to redeem the human race and restore creation, including our work, to something wonderful and beautiful, even beyond our craziest dreams. At age 33, he was dead, nailed to a cross. People spat on him, cursed him. People said, if you are truly the son of God, why don't you go down and save yourself? But he understood that it was for a greatest pur great, greater purpose. So he died on that cross, and everybody said it was the greatest failure in history. Or so they thought. Because three days later, when people came and searched for the body of the greatest worker in history, his tomb was empty because he had risen again. He had conquered death. He worked out our redemption. He worked out to bridge that gap between us and our original creator because it was something we could never work out ourselves. And then he ascended upwards to his rightful throne in heaven. He redeemed us. He redeemed our work. The greatest worker in history, also our master, also our creator, also our maker, Jesus. We are all in need of redemption. Our work, just like everything else in our life, is in need of redemption. And no matter how hard or how much we try to work, we'll never redeem our work, our lives on our own. That's why Jesus came down, to redeem it on our behalf. Our work is redeemed. So please, if there's one point I want everybody to take away today, it is this. Hope in a Redeemer and discover your Savior, the Lord Jesus. We are in need of redemption. Our work is in need of redemption, and we have already been redeemed. Our work has already been redeemed. True success at work begins with the right view of work. So to close, five points. Work is a calling. Move from success to significance and discover the pleasure of your maker. Work is sacred. Embrace dignity in the everyday and discover the glory of your holy God. Work is stewardship. Personify grit, which is passion times perseverance. Be willing to take risk and discover the joy of your faithful master. Work is ethical. So do great by doing right and discover the abundance of your righteous God. And finally, work, just like ourselves, has been redeemed. So hope in a redeemer and discover your savior, the Lord Jesus. Can I invite everybody to stand and let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for this time, for the blessing of hearing your message, Lord God, for reminding us, Lord, that no matter how hard we try or how hard we work, we can't bridge that gap to you. But because of your great love for us, you sacrificed your own life, Lord Jesus, so that gap could be bridged and we could be restored and redeemed back to you, including our work. And Lord, may you help all of us discover our calling because work is a calling. 
May you remind us, Father, that anything we do is sacred. Help us, Lord God, to have passion, perseverance, and risk as we work towards your glory, Father, your pleasure, your joy. And Lord Jesus, help us to have absolute moral compass to do what is right every day. Guide us, Lord Jesus. And I pray for all of us today that as we work, we be excellent, Lord. And for anybody here, Father, who doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you just continue to touch and to work in their hearts, that whatever crazy dreams they have about success and work, reveal to them that what you have planned out for their lives is so much greater, and it'll blow their minds away. We thank you. And we pray that in every day, including our work, we feel your pleasure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a blessed Sunday.